Welcome everyone to tonight's Doctrine of Christ live stream. My name is Steve Breiner and tonight we are going to discuss, we're going to continue the discussion from two weeks ago in DNC 76 about the plan of salvation. And tonight, particularly, we are going to focus on the testimony of Jesus and what that is. Uh, that, that's talked about in DNC 76, uh, verse 50 and 51, receiving the testimony of Jesus. What is that? What does that mean? What does that entail? Um, so we'll go through, we probably won't cover too many verses tonight, but uh, we'll, we'll have a good time. Let's start by looking at the typical plan of salvation as the LDS church teaches it. Now, this is the kind of the standard that I taught. I went on a mission to Argentina, and which I loved. And this is kind of the very, very first thing that you teach your investigators uh, when you talk to them about the plan of salvation. So this is absolutely the most very, very basic, most baseline teaching that we can possibly understand about DNC 76. And if you uh, you remember, it's got it's just got the bubbles, the premortal existence, earth life, spirit world, resurrection, final judgment, and then we're judged to three kingdoms: celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. Um, now, kind of the typical understanding is that it, the judgment is final, and then you're judged to telestial, terrestrial, or celestial, and that's not the case as far as the scriptures teach us. That is not the case. Hiram, and we'll go over that tonight. Hiram Smith said the following. This is really cool what he said. He said, those of the terrestrial glory either advance to the celestial or recede to the telestial, else the moon could not be a type. It waxes and it wanes. In other words, the waxing and the waning of the moon is symbolic of people coming and people leaving from the terrestrial kingdom. and you either you you go in and you leave and you leave and you either recede to the telestial or you progress to the telestial and then it appears that once you once you obtain that celestial glory that you can still come down jesus christ was a celestial being and he came down again to the telestial kingdom which is here on earth okay let's start out Let's start out in DNC 101, and we're talking about the tower. DNC 101, verses 45 through 46, as an introduction. Verse 45, and set watchmen, this is the parable of the redemption of Zion. We've talked about it a lot. And set watchmen round about them and build a tower. Now, what is that tower? What is this tower that we're going to build? Um, you may remember the, the Tower of Babel, and that tower is a tower that we build in Babylon. And if there is an equal and opposite in everything, if there is a tower of Babylon, then the Lord has to have his tower as well. And that's what we're talking about here in verse 45. And set watchmen round about them and build a tower that one may overlook the land round about to be a watchman upon the tower, that mine olive trees may not be broken down when the enemy shall come to spoil and take upon themselves the fruit of my vineyard. Now the servants of the nobleman went and did as their Lord commanded them and planted the olive trees and built a hedge round about. That hedge is the new and everlasting covenant and set watchmen and began to build a tower. Now that tower that we're talking about begins in DNC 76. It is a tower of ascension. Now let's start in DNC 76 verse 50. Again, this is a continuation from what we talked about two weeks ago. We stood, we did DNC 76, 1 through 49, two weeks ago, and we're going to continue in verse 50 this week, speaking about the testimony of Jesus. DNC 76, verse 50. And again, we bear record. This is Joseph and Sidney Rigdon speaking. We bear record, for we saw and heard. Now, this is an ascension experience. They've been taken up to the high mountain, as Nephi puts it, and they are in the presence of the Lord, and he is the one that is teaching them. And they are what they are seeing is him, and they are hearing him. And again, we bear record, for we saw and heard, and this is the testimony. This is their testimony of the, what they saw and heard. And this is the testimony of the gospel of Christ concerning them 
who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. Okay? So, in other words, these people that they are seeing that came forth in the resurrection of the just, they entered into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or in other words, they entered into the new and everlasting covenant. Now, let's look at that verse a little more closely. Um, who is it that, that will come forth in the resurrection of the just? Well, who is it that is just? We have a just God. And so Jesus Christ is the one who is just. And let's just, let's, let's, let's play that out a little bit and see where that goes. Um, it's interesting to note that this, that this verse that who shall come forth in the resurrection of the, of the just, this is a bookended verse. Now, DNC 76 verse 65 is the other bookend. These are they who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just, is what DNC 76 65 says. So we've got DNC 76 50, resurrection of the just. They see the people. DNC 76 65, that's the other bookend. So between these two bookends, between 50 and 65, okay, that gives us the outline for what we need to do to come forth in the resurrection of the just or in other words, the resurrection of the Christ, of Christ, because he is the one who is just. Again, this, the just, the resurrection of the just is the resurrection of Christ. It is being granted eternal life by him who can grant that. This is being granted salvation. This is being sanctified by the blood of the lamb. And this is what the next 15 verses are going to talk about, and we're going to sort it all out. So Paul uh, in Acts, he talks about this resurrection, the resurrection of the just. So let's go to Acts 24, verses 14 and 15. And Acts 24 is a really cool story. It's it's Paul, and he's been brought before a tribunal. He's been accused, and a lawyer has gone, a couple, a lawyer and a high priest, a high priest of the Pharisees, has brought Paul before this tribunal and accused him of of I forget what they accused him of anyway go read go read Acts 24 but in his defense in Acts 24 verses 14 and 15 this is what Paul says he says but I confess unto thee and the thee is everyone that has accused him but I confess unto thee after that that after the way now that's an interesting word who what or who is the way well who is the way, the truth, and the life? Well, that is Jesus Christ. But I confess unto thee that after the way or after Christ, which they, my accusers, call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. So after the way of Jesus Christ, which is entering into the new and everlasting covenant, let's start over. But I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Okay, so I, I enter into the new and everlasting covenant. I, Paul, I follow Jesus Christ in the way that he wants me to do it, and they call it heresy. Continue on. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Okay, so Paul is teaching that there's a resurrection, and there's two resurrections, a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. So what is, let's, let's, we know what, we know who is just, that is Christ. Let's go to Psalm 43, verse 1, to find out who is unjust, and it's pretty self-explanatory. Psalm 43, verse 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. So we come forth in the resurrection of the just. We are resurrected to Christ to dwell with him. We come forth in the resurrection of the unjust to dwell in the kingdom of Satan. He, we are delivered up to him. So the unjust man, Satan, of course, um, the just come forth. In the millennium or into the terrestrial kingdom and the unjust come forth in a future telestial kingdom or after the next millennium let's go to dnc 76 verse 51 continue on they are they 
who received the testimony of Jesus. So I'll just read the whole verse and then there's a lot here. So we'll break it down. 7651. They are they who received the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name. And this according to the commandment which he has given. Okay. So water baptism in this ascension process in coming forth in the resurrection of the just, water baptism is not the first step. Again, they are they who received the testimony of Jesus. So that is step one. And it's so crucial. Most people skip over that step and go right to water baptism. And then they're damned at water baptism because they, they skip that first step. So it is so crucial that we understand what the testimony of Jesus is. What is that testimony? We absolutely have to receive this. This is step one in this whole process. So let's look at a couple of examples of this in the scriptures. Let's look at Alma preaching to the Zoramites. And this is a group of people who were following after a man. We talked about this in the last Zoomcast you know, two weeks ago. The Zoramites, who, were, who were, a were a group of people who were seeking after and following a man whose name was Zoram, and they received the testimony of a man, not of Jesus. So, And this is a people who did not incorporate God into their everyday lives. So let's go to Alma chapter 31, verses 23 through 28. And this is just kind of a setup of what were the Zoramites doing and how were they worshiping. And this is a setup because we need to understand what they were doing. And then Alma comes in, in Alma 32, and he teaches them the correct way. This is a people who are at baseline. They're at zero. They've got to start. Step one for them is receiving the testimony of Jesus. Okay. Alma 31 verses 23 through 28, starting in verse 23. Now, after the people had all offered up thanks after this manner, remember they go up to the Ramiumptum, they returned to their homes, never speaking of their God again, until they had assembled themselves together again to the holy stand to offer up thanks after this manner. Now when Alma saw this, his heart was grieved, for he saw that they were a wicked and a perverse people. Now DNC 84, let's make a note there real quick, DNC 84 defines the wicked as those who do not enter into covenant with Jesus Christ. Those who are wicked seek after men or their own hearts. The righteous enter into the new and everlasting covenant and seek after Jesus Christ. Again, verse 24. Now, when Alma saw this, his heart was grieved, for he saw that they were a wicked, didn't enter into the new covenant, and a perverse people. Yea, he saw that their hearts were set upon gold and upon silver and upon all manner of fine goods. Yea, and he also saw that their hearts were lifted up unto great boasting in their pride. And he lifted up his voice to heaven and cried, saying, O oh, how long, O Lord, wilt thou suffer that thy servant shall dwell here below in the flesh to behold such gross wickedness among the children of men? So when they saw this, they were, they were pained. It hurt them. They saw the Zoramites and how they were worshiping, that they were not entering into covenant with Jesus Christ, that they were seeking after a man, that they followed a man named Zoram, and it pained their hearts. Verse 27, behold, O God, they cry unto thee, and yet their hearts are swallowed up in their pride. Behold, O God, they cry unto thee with their mouths while they are puffed up even to greatness with the vain things of the world. Behold, O my God, their costly apparel and their ringlets and their bracelets and their ornaments of gold and all their precious things which they are ornamented with. And behold, their hearts are set upon them. And yet they cry unto thee and say, We thank thee, O God. For we are a chosen people unto thee, while others shall perish. So they think that because of their worshiping, the way they worship, that they are greater than everyone else and that they are going to be saved in the kingdom of God ahead of everyone else. Obviously a false teaching. So let's check out what Alma has to say. How does Alma correct them? He goes in and remember he finds... He finds success amongst the poorer people of the Zoramites. So let's go to Alma 32, 37 through 33. 
let's look at what Alma has to say to the Zoramites. How does he correct them? Verse 27 in Alma 32. But behold, if you will awake and arouse your, arouse your faculties, even to an experiment upon my words and exercise a particle of faith, yea, even if you can no more than desire to believe, let this desire work in you, even until you believe in a manner that you can give place for a portion of my words. Now, we will compare the word unto a seed. Now, if you give place that a seed may be planted in your heart, behold, if it be a true seed or a good seed, if you do not cast it out by your unbelief, that you will resist the spirit of the Lord, behold, it will begin to swell within your breasts. And when you feel these swelling motions, you will begin to say within yourselves, it must needs be that this is a good seed or that the word, who is the word? The word is Jesus Christ or that Christ is good for it beginneth to enlarge my soul. It beginneth to enlighten my understanding. Yea, it beginneth to be delicious to me. Now behold, would not this increase your faith? I say unto you, yea, nevertheless, it hath, it hath not grown up to a perfect knowledge. Well, what is a perfect knowledge? A perfect knowledge is entering into to the rest of the Lord in the fullness of his glory. That is what a perfect knowledge is. It is seeing Jesus Christ and being taught by him face to face, as Moses was in Moses chapter 1. Verse 30, but behold, as the seed swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow, then ye must needs say that the seed is good. For behold, it swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow. And now behold, will not this strengthen your faith? Yea, it will strengthen your faith. For you will say, I know that this is a good seed. For behold, it sprouteth and beginneth to grow. And now behold, are ye sure that this is a good seed? I say unto you, yea, for every seed bringeth forth unto its own likeness. Therefore, if a seed groweth, it is good. But if it groweth not, behold, it is not good. Therefore, it is cast away. And now behold, because ye have tried the experiment and planted the seed, and it swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow, ye must needs know that the seed is good. So Alma goes in and he's telling them, look, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to. Just try. Just try and have a, even just try and even have a desire to want to know if the things that I'm telling you are true. Just try. And then he's, I mean, we know the rest of the story. Let's read verse 30, 33 again. And now behold, because you have tried the experiment and planted the seed and it swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow, you must needs know that the seed is good. So this is the testimony of Jesus. This is awakening. This is planting the seed and realizing the awful situation that you are in. Alma was trying to awaken the Zoramites to even experiment upon his word. So if this if you're here for the first time, don't just slam the door without trying it. Try it. Just try it and if the seed is good, if it adds to your soul, then continue. Continue entering into covenant with Jesus Christ. Let's go to DNC 76 verse 51 once more and read it again. They are they who received the testimony of Jesus. So these are the people that awakened and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name, and this according to the commandment which he has given. The Zoramites, they were a religious people. They were doing, worshiping God in the manner that they thought that God wanted them to worship him. So they were not ignorant of God. They just didn't worship God in the way that he wanted them to worship him. And Alma went in. That's what Alma was trying to correct. Go to God. Don't worry about Zoram, whatever he's teaching you. Go to God. So DNC 7651, these are they who received the testimony of Jesus. Let's look at one more scenario of, of, where, of how this plays out in the Book of Mormon. What does Again, what does receiving the testimony of Jesus look like? And let's look at a man that awakened and realized that he needed to repent. And the man that we're going to look at is King Lamoni's father. And he's often overlooked because 
a lot of times we focus so much on Lamoni and what happened with him and Ammon that King Lamoni's father is overlooked. And he's got a really cool story. Uh, this is some setup. Al Let's go to Alma chapter 20, verses 1 through 27. We're going to read quite a bit in Alma. So let's start in verses 1 through 7. This is a setup as to what is going on and with King Lamoni's father. Alma chapter 20, verse 1. And it came to pass that when they had established a church in the land, that King Lamoni desired that Ammon should go with him to the land of Nephi, that he might show him unto his father. So Lamoni is doing the same thing that, that Lehi did in his vision of the tree of life. He's saying, he's saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. This is so cool. What Ammon is showing me, I got to show my family. I got to show my dad. Ammon, you got to come with me, and I want my dad to meet you, and he's going to love you. Well, okay. Let's keep going. And the voice of the Lord came to Ammon, saying, Thou shalt not go up to the land of Nephi, for behold, the king will seek thy life. So King Lamoni is very excited for this. Ammon's like, you know, he's he's not going to like me very much. Okay, Thou shalt not go up to the land of, of Nephi, for behold, the king will seek thy life. But thou shalt go to the land of Midianai. For behold, thy brother Aaron and also Mulekai and Amma are in prison. Now, it was uh, it was King Lamoni. King King Lamoni's father eventually releases them from prison, and we'll get to that. Verse three. Now it came to pass that when Ammon had heard this, he said unto Lamoni, "Behold, my brother and brethren are in prison at Midianai, and I go that I may deliver them." Now Lamoni said unto Ammon, "I know in the strength of the Lord thou canst do all things, but behold, I will go with thee to the land of Midianai." For the king of the land of Midianai, whose name is Antiomno, is a friend unto me. Therefore, I go to the land of Midianai, that I may flatter the king of the land, and he will cast thy brethren out of prison. Now Lamoni said unto him, Who told thee that thy brethren were in prison? And Ammon said unto him, No one hath told me, save it be God. And he said unto me, Go and deliver thy brethren, for they are in prison in the land of Midianai. Now, when Lamoni had heard this, he caused that his servants should make ready his horses and chariots. And he said unto Ammon, come, I will go with thee to the land of Midianai, and there I will plead with the king, and he will cast thy brethren out of prison. So to recap, we've got Ammon and Lamoni. They are friends now, and, and Lamoni believes that Ammon is a true prophet of the Lord, and, and Ammon has received a revelation from the Lord that he needs to go and help his brethren in the land of Midianai. And King Lamoni says, right on, I'll go with you. Okay, now this is where it starts to get good in verse 8. So they leave Ammon and Lamoni. They go off in, in his chariot to the land of Midianai. Verse 8, and it came to pass that as Ammon and Lamoni were journeying thither, they met the father of Lamoni, who was king over all the land. And behold, the father of Lamoni said unto him, Why did ye to Lamoni, why did ye not come to the feast on that great day when I made a feast unto my sons and unto my people? And he also said, Whither art thou going with this Nephite who is one of the children of a liar? So can you imagine if Nephi had gone to Lamoni's father alone? And it came to pass that Lamoni rehearsed unto him whither he was going, for he feared to offend him. And he also told him the cause of all his tarrying in his own kingdom, that he did not go under, that he did not go unto his father to the feast which he had prepared. And now when Lamoni had rehearsed unto him all these things, behold, to his astonishment, his father was angry with him and said, Lamoni, thou art going to deliver these Nephites who are sons of a liar. Behold, he robbed our fathers. And now his children are also come amongst us that they may, by their cunning and their lyings, deceive us that they may again that they, that they again may rob us of our property. Now the father of Lamoni commanded him that he should slay Ammon with the sword, and he also commanded him that he should not go to the land of Midianai, but he, that he should return with him to the land of Ishmael. But Lamoni said unto him, I will not slay Ammon, neither will I return to the land of Ishmael, but I go to the land of Midianai, that I may release the brethren of Ammon, for I know that they are just men and holy prophets of the true God. Now, when his father had heard these words, he was angry with him, and he drew his sword that he might smite him to the earth. But Ammon stood forth and said unto him, Behold, thou shalt not slay thy son. 
Nevertheless, it were better that he should fall than he, than thee. For behold, he has repented of his sins. But if thou shouldest fall at this time in thine anger, thy soul could not be saved. And again, it is expedient that thou shouldest forbear. For if thou shouldest slay thy son, he being an innocent man, his blood would cry from the ground to the Lord his God for vengeance to come upon thee. And perhaps thou wouldest lose thy soul. Now, when Ammon had said these words unto him, he answered him saying, this is King Lamoni's father answering Ammon. King Lamoni's father answered him saying, I know that if he, that if I should slay my son, that I should shed innocent blood, for it is thou that has sought to destroy him. Now he, sh he shifted his anger from, from his son to Ammon, and he stretched forth his hand to slay Ammon. But Ammon withstood his blows and also smote his arm that he could not use it. So he injured the king. Verse 21. Now when the king saw that Ammon could slay, could slay him, he began to plead with Ammon that he would spare his life. But Ammon raised his sword and said unto him, Behold, I will smite thee, except thou wilt grant unto me that my brethren may be cast out of prison. Now the king, fearing he should lose his life, said, If thou wilt spare me, I will grant unto thee whatsoever thou wilt ask, even to half of the kingdom. Now when Ammon saw that he had wrought upon the old king according to his desire, he said unto him, If thou wilt grant unto my brethren, if thou wilt grant that my brethren may be cast out of prison, and also that Lamoni may retain his kingdom, that ye be not displeased with him, but grant that he may do according to his own desires in whatsoever thing he thinketh, then will I spare thee. Otherwise I will smite thee to the earth. Okay, so really Ammon doesn't want anything for himself. All he wants is for Lamoni to retain his kingdom and for his brethren to be freed from prison. Verse 25. Now when Ammon had said these words, the king to began to rejoice because of his life. And when he saw that Ammon had no desire to destroy him, and might I add his life or temporally, because Ammon didn't ask anything for himself, the only thing he desired was for his friend Lamoni and for his brethren again. Verse 26 again. And when he saw that Ammon had no desire to destroy him, and when he also saw the great love he had for his son Lamoni, he was astonished exceedingly and said, Because this is all thou hast desired, that I would release thy brethren and suffer that my son Lamoni should retain his kingdom, behold. I will grant unto you that my son may retain his kingdom from this time and forever, and I will govern him no more. So King Lamoni gives Ammon his first request. Verse 27, and I will also grant unto thee that thy brethren may be cast out of prison and that thou and thy brethren may come unto me in my kingdom, for I shall greatly desire to see thee. For the king was greatly astonished at the words which he had spoken, and also at the words which had been spoken by his son Lamoni. Therefore, he was desirous to learn them. Okay, so do you see do you see the softening that has taken place here in King Lamoni's father? First, it took place in King Lamoni, and we know that story. And now we see it happening with his father. He wanted to murder Ammon. He wanted Ammon dead. And now all of a sudden, the king is desirous to learn the things that Ammon taught to his son, King Lamoni. Okay, let's keep, it gets even better. Alma, let's go to Alma chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. We see an even greater softening occur here in Alma chapter 22. It, we see King Lamoni, he was just so angry. I mean, furiously angry at his own son and at Ammon. And we again, we see him softening. We see him coming to a testimony of Jesus. That's what we're talking about here from DNC 7 or from DNC 7651. Alma chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. This is the softening of King Lamoni. Verse 1. Now, as Ammon was thus teaching the people of Lamoni continually, we will return to the account of Aaron and his brethren. For after he departed from the land of Midianai, he was led by the Spirit to the land of Nephi, even to the house of the king, which was over all the land, save it were the land of Ishmael. And he was the father of Lamoni. And it came to pass that he went in unto him in the king's palace. This is Ammon. With his, oh no, I'm sorry, this is, this is Aaron, I'm sorry. 
that Aaron, that he went into unto him into the king's palace with his brethren and bowed himself before the king and said unto him, Behold, O king, we are the brethren of Ammon, whom thou hast delivered out of prison. And now, O king, if thou wilt spare our lives, we will be thy servants. Do you see a pattern here? This is the exact same thing that Ammon said to King Lamoni. And the king said unto them, Arise, for I will grant unto you your lives, and I will not suffer that ye shall be my servants. But I will insist that ye shall administer unto me, for I have been somewhat troubled in mind because of the generosity and the greatness of the words of thy brother Ammon. And I desire to know the cause why he has not come up out of Midianai with thee. And Aaron said unto the king, Behold, the spirit of the Lord has called him another way. He has gone to the land of Ishmael to teach the people of Lamoni. Now the king said unto them, this is so cool. The king is curious. He has a question. He wants to know something that they believe. Now the king said unto them, what is this that ye have said concerning the spirit of the Lord? Okay. Aaron, just in the verse previous, let's read it one more time. Verse four, and Aaron said unto the king, behold, the spirit of the Lord has called him another way. And he has gone to the land of Ishmael to teach the people of Lamoni. Now, this, this pricks some interest in the heart of the king. Now, the king said he has a question. This is the beginning for the king. This is so cool. Now, the king said unto them, what is this that ye have said concerning the spirit of the Lord? Behold, this is the thing which doth trouble me. And also, what is this that Ammon said? If you will repent, ye shall be saved. And if you will not repent, ye shall be cast off at the last day. And Aaron answered and said unto Aaron answered him and said unto him, Believest thou that there is a God? And the king said, I know that the Amalekites say that there is a God, and I have granted unto them that they should build sanctuaries and that they may assemble themselves to worship him. And if now thou sayest that there is a God, behold, I will believe. You see the parallels between King Lamoni and his father? It's like uh, the verse the verse in Alma 17, I don't have it in front of me, but it says, behold, the king was caught with guile. In other words, Ammon had him, and now Aaron has got his father, not, not, in, in, not with guile, but to the point where the king will at least listen to his words. He's curious, and he wants to know more. And if you've ever tried to teach people about the new and everlasting covenant, the majority will just reject you out of hand and say, nope, I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. But if curiosity starts in their minds, and they will just ask you one single question, if they just have a, just a little bit of curiosity, then that's something like the seed that's planted. You can just begin to work with that. And, and the Lord takes over from there. And it's just beautiful. Okay, let's read verse 7 one more time. And Aaron answered him and said unto him, Believest thou that there is a God? And the king said, I know that the Amalekites say that there is a God. In other words, if they believe there's a God, and you're telling me that there's a God, I think that there's a possibility that there's a God, and I want to know more. And I have granted unto them that they should build sanctuaries, that they may assemble themselves together to worship, to worship him, God. And if now thou sayest, Aaron, there is a God, behold, I will believe. And now when Aaron heard this, his heart began to rejoice, and he said, Behold, assuredly, as thou livest, O king, there is a God. And the king said, is that is God, that great spirit that brought our fathers out of the land of Jerusalem? And Aaron said unto him, yea, he is that great spirit. And he created all things, both in heaven and in earth. Believest thou this? And he said, yea, I believe that the great spirit created all things. And I desire that ye should tell me concerning all these things. And I will believe thy words. Boom. Golden investigator. Verse 12, and it came to pass that when Aaron saw that the king would believe his words, he began from the creation of Adam 
reading the scriptures unto the king. Now notice how Aaron did not use his own words. He did not use the words of Aaron, a man. He read the scriptures to the king. He read the words of the Lord as given through his prophets, reading the scripture unto the king. How God created man after his own image and that God gave him commandments and that because of transgression, man had fallen. And Aaron did expound unto him the scriptures, the scriptures, again, not Aaron's own words. And Aaron did expound unto him the scriptures from the creation of Adam, laying the fall of man before him and their carnal state and also the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption is faith, repentance, baptism by water, baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is being redeemed. The plan of redemption, which was prepared from the foundation of the world, through Christ, for all whosoever would believe on his name, there is no other way. In other words, King, there is no other way other than Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is no other way, King. And since man had fallen, verse 14, and since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself, but the sufferings and death of Christ atone for their sins through faith and repentance and so forth. Remember, we just talked about it. And that he breaketh the brands, bands of death, that the grave shall have no victory, and that the sting of death should be swallowed up in the hopes of glory. And Aaron did expound all these things unto the king. Verse 15, and it came to pass that after Aaron had expounded these things unto him, the king said, what shall I do that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken? Yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast? In other words, what do I need to do to receive the baptism of fire and the gift of the Holy Ghost? I need to be born again of God. I need to enter in, as Nephi calls it, the gate. Yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, and receive his spirit that I may be filled with joy, that I may not be cast off at the last day? Behold, said he, I will give up all that I possess. Yea, I will forsake my kingdom that I may receive this great joy. So in other words, King Lamoni's father is entering into the new and everlasting covenant right there. He says it. I offer everything that I have, whatever I have. It doesn't matter if it's my, my kingdom, my family, my good name, everything that I have, even my own life. I will give it all up so that I can receive this great joy verse 16 that is the new and everlasting covenant but Aaron said unto him if thou desirest this thing if thou wilt bow down before God yea if thou wilt re repent of all thy sins and will bow down before God and call on his name in faith believing that ye shall receive then shalt thou receive the hope which thou desirest in other words if you really do that if you enter into covenant with God then it'll be fine you'll receive it Verse 17, and it came to pass that when Aaron had said these words, the king did bow down before the Lord upon his knees. Yea, even he did prostrate himself on the earth and cried mightily, saying, O oh God, Aaron hath told me. Now, this is a prayer we're reading here. O oh God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. He doesn't even know if there is a God. He is just desiring to know if there even is a God. That's his only desire. He's just barely taking this little tiny seed and planting it. He just has this desire and he doesn't know really what to do, what to do with it other than Aaron has told him to pray. So that's what he's doing. This is his prayer. Oh God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me? And I will give away all my sins to know thee. In other words, I'll offer up all my idols to know you, that I may be raised from the dead. Now, that's an interesting use of the word dead, because generally in the Book of Mormon, King Lamoni is not dead as to the mortal body. Now, the prophets in the Book of Mormon, when they refer to death as in a temporal death, as in my body has gone down to the grave, they make a distinction. They always say dead as to the mortal body. But when they just say the word dead, it's referring to a spiritual death. In other words, King Lamoni, 
King Lamoni's father here realizes that he is spiritually dead and that he needs Jesus Christ in order to receive life. That I may, I will give away all my sins to know thee and that I, that, and that I may be raised from the dead and be saved at the last day. And now when the king has said these words, he was struck as if he were dead. Now, uh, the rest of the story, the queen comes in and the servants come in and the queen, um, the queen is upset that her husband is lying down and she, Ammon thinks that she is going to go out and cause a disturbance amongst the people and bring in the people to cause problems. And so rather than wait for the Lord to raise King Lamoni's father up, uh, Aaron raises him up. Um, and and everything's fine. Let's so let's let's continue. Let's go to Alma 23 verses 1 through 6 and see what happens as a result of all of this. Uh, Alma 23 1 through 6. Behold, now it came to pass that the king of the Lamanites sent a proclamation among all his people that they should not lay their hands on Ammon or Aaron or Omner or Himni nor either of their brethren who should go forth preaching the word of God in whatsoever place they should be in any part of their land. Yea, he sent a decree among them that they should not lay their hands on them to bind them or to cast them into prison. Neither should they spit upon them, nor smite them, nor cast them out of their synagogues, nor scourge them. Neither should they cast stones at them, but that they should have free access to their houses and also their temples and their sanctuaries. And thus they might go forth and preach the word according to their desires. For the king had been converted unto the Lord and all his household. Therefore he sent his proclamation through the land unto his people, that the word of God might have no obstruction, but that it might go forth throughout all the land, that his people might be convinced concerning the wicked traditions of their fathers. What were those wicked traditions? It was following after the desires of their own hearts and not entering into covenant with God. That his people might be convinced concerning the tradition, the wicked traditions of their fathers, and that they might be convinced that they were all brethren, and that they ought not to murder, nor to plunder, nor to steal, nor to commit adultery, nor to commit any manner of wickedness. And now it came to pass that when the king had sent forth this proclamation, now you guys remember, this is the king that wanted to kill Ammon and that threw his brothers in prison. And now it came to pass that when the king had sent forth this proclamation that Aaron and his brethren went forth from city to city and from one house of worship to another, establishing churches and consecrating priests and teachers throughout the land of the Laman, throughout the land among the Lamanites to preach and to teach the word of God among them. And thus they began to have great success and thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord. Yea, thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Nephites. What were the traditions of the Nephites? Well, it was the doctrine of Christ. It was entering into covenant with Jesus Christ and, the, and, and God the Father. Believe in the traditions of the Nephites, and they were taught the records and prophecies which were handed down even to the present time. In other words, the, the people of Nephi, Ammon and Aaron and his brethren, they taught the people the scriptures, which the Lamanites did not have. Let's read verse 5. One. Let's read verse 5. And thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord, yea, thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Nephites, and they were taught the records and prophecies which were handed down even to the present time. Verse 6, and as sure as the Lord liveth, so sure as many as believed, or as many as were brought to the knowledge of the truth through the preaching of Ammon and his brethren, according to the spirit of revelation and prophecy and the power of God working miracles in them. Yea, I say unto you, as the Lord liveth, as many as the Lamanites as believed in their preaching and were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. So you can see the effect that one man, one man receiving the testimony of Jesus what effect that has or can have on a people as a ripple effect. It just rippled through the entire Lamanite population. So that is what the testimony of Jesus is. It is realizing that you are nothing and that you need Christ more than ever. And Christ is the only one you need. This is what the entire Book of Mormon about. 
we have a man go from killing people, wanting to kill people and murder people to entering into the new and everlasting covenant and proclaiming religious freedom amongst all his people so that all of them may enter into covenant with God. We go from a hard heart to a soft heart. And this is only through Jesus Christ. This is step one. This is so crucial, this step. And it's a step that so many people jump right over and they just say, oh, I need to be baptized. And so they go and get baptized. DNC 76, verse 51, one more time. And they are they. These are the people who come forth in the resurrection of Christ. They are they who received the testimony of Jesus. Step one. And believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name. And this according to the commandment which he has given. As we read this, um, remember that baptism is not what saves us. That is a dead work if we're looking at it like that. Baptism, just going down in the water and getting wet and having somebody raise their arm to the square and say a prayer, that is not what saves us. And if we think that, then we're resting the scriptures and we're mistaken. What saves us is receiving the testimony of Jesus and entering into covenant with him and doing that over and over and over and over again. Water baptism in and of itself does nothing. It is entering into the testimony of Jesus and having this born again experience. It's receiving this mighty change of heart and receiving receiving Christ into our lives. Let's go to DNC 22 verses 1 through 4 to look at water baptism. DNC 22 verses 1 through 4. Behold, I say unto you that all old covenants have I caused to be done away in this thing. Well, what is this thing? Well, he's about to tell us. And this is a new and everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning. So this is the same covenant that Adam entered into, that Noah entered into, that all of the great prophets entered into. They all just went to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm here. What would you have me do? It's exactly what Nephi did. Lord, I'm here. What would you have me do? Go get the brass plates. Okay, I'll do that. Build a boat. Okay, I'll do that. Cross this ocean. Okay, I'll do that. Make some plates of my own and write in the plates everything that's happened. Okay, I do that. I don't really understand any of this, but I know that you can see everything and that I have a very, very small picture. It's the same thing we have to do. We're not commanded to to build, to write, to make plates or to write on plates or to build a boat or to cross an ocean. Those were things specific to Nephi. Okay. We have things that are specific to us that we have to do. And the only way to do that, verse one, behold, I say unto you that all old covenants have I caused to be done away in this thing. And this is a new and everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning. Wherefore, although a man should be baptized an hundred times, it availeth him nothing. For you cannot enter in at the straight gate by the law of Moses, neither by your dead works. For it is because of your dead works that I have caused this last covenant and this church to be built up unto me, even as in days of old. Now, what church is this? This is the church of Christ. Wherefore, enter ye in at the gate. What is the gate? That is the baptism of fire gift of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, enter ye in at the gate as I have commanded and seek not to counsel your God. Amen. In other words, I'm God and I'm telling you what to do to come to me. Okay. Don't come to me and tell me what you need to do to get back to me. Don't come to me and try and tell me what you need to be doing. I'm the one that gives the commandments. I'm the one that tells you what to do. Humble yourself and follow me and I will lead you back. Okay. DNC 76, verse 52. We are moving right along here. We've done two verses in DNC 76. Okay. DNC 76, verse 52. That by keeping the commandments. Now, we just talked about that. What does that mean? That is the new covenant. That is entering into the new and everlasting covenant and receiving the testimony of Jesus over and over again. That by keeping the commandments, they might be washed and cleansed 
from all their sins and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power. Now, there is a lot in that verse, and we're going to break it down. Notice how, again, it is not the actual baptism by water that cleanses us. It is entering into, the, into covenant and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost that justifies us. And typically in the LDS church, in fact, I even remember primary lessons where we learned about this. We look at water baptism as receiving forgiveness of our sins. I even taught it as a missionary like this. We, we go down in the water and our sins are left in the water and we, are, we come up a new person. And that's not what the scriptures are saying. We rest the scriptures if we interpret it like that. Another false tradition that we do is we say that every week we go and we take the sacrament and we receive that same, we, we, we renew those baptismal covenants, which is true, and that we, we receive a brand new forgiveness each week. And those are false traditions, and we're going to explore why those are false traditions. Let's go to 2 Nephi chapter 31 verses 17 and 18, very common scripture. We read it a lot. 2 Nephi 31, 17 and 18, the doctrine of Christ. What is the gate? Okay, verse, verse 52 in DNC 76, um, that by keeping the commandments, they may be washed and cleansed from all their sins and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying out of hands of him who is ordained and sealed under this power. 2 Nephi 31, 17 explains exactly what, what is going on in verse 52. Verse 17, 2 Nephi 31. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, I have seen that your Lord and Redeemer should do. And it's interesting that he uses the word Redeemer there. Okay, He doesn't use Savior. He doesn't use Christ. He uses the word Redeemer. And there's a specific reason for that. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For for this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism in wa by water. And then cometh a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. So it's not actually until we enter that gate and receive the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, that that remission of sins, that we are justified, that that is complete. Verse 18, and then ye are in this straight and narrow path, which leads to eternal life. So until we are baptized by the Holy Ghost, we're not even on the path. And then you're in this straight and narrow path, which leads to eternal life. Yea, Ye have entered in by the gate. Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son. That's new and everlasting covenant language. And ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son, unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if ye entered in by the way, ye should receive. So in other words, receiving this gift, this is not just a feeling in our heart. Let's read it one more time. Verse 18. And then are ye in this straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate. This is the gate to eternal life. You're just entering in on the path. Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son. To get this far, it doesn't stop there. And ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if he entered in by the way, he should receive. Okay, DNC 7652, one more time. That by keeping the commandments, they may be washed and cleansed from all their sins and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power. Okay, we've talked about keeping the commandments. We've talked about being washed and cleansed from their sins. We've talked about receiving the Holy Spirit. And actually, I'm going to read one more. I'm going to read one that I didn't expect to read. It's in Joseph Smith History. Joseph Smith History 1. There's only one. Joseph Smith History 1. It's verses 72 through 74. 
And I didn't expect to be reading this, but it's so good. I just want to read it. Joseph Smith History 1. This is about Joseph Smith and Oliver and when they received the priesthood and were consequently baptized. What happened? What, what was the process that they went through? Verse 72. The messenger who visited us on this occasion and conferred this priesthood upon us said that his name was John. This is John the Baptist. The same that is called John the Baptist. There it is. In the New Testament. And that he acted under the direction of Peter, James, and John, who held the keys of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which priesthood, he said, would, would in due time be conferred upon us. And that I should be called the first elder of the church, and that he, Oliver, the second. And it was the 15th day of May, 1829, that we were ordained under the hand of this messenger and baptized. Immediately on our coming up out of the water, after we had been baptized, we experienced great and glorious blessings from our Heavenly Father, no sooner had I baptized Oliver Cowdery than the Holy Ghost fell upon him, and he stood up and prophesied many things which should shortly come to pass. And again, so soon as I had baptized, I had been baptized by him. I also had the spirit of prophecy when standing up. I, in other words, I got, I received the baptism of Holy Ghost as well, of the Holy Ghost as well. I prophesied concerning the rise of this church, the Church of Christ, and many other things connected with the church and this generation of the children of men. We were filled with the Holy Ghost and rejoiced in the God of our salvation. Our minds being now enlightened, okay? Remember speaking with the tongue of angels, receiving the, the baptism of fire, gift of the Holy Ghost, you become a new person. Our minds now being enlightened, we begin to have the scriptures laid open to our understandings. Things that they didn't understand before in the scriptures, they now understood. And the true meaning, in other words, there is a false meaning that can be misunderstood, and there is a true meaning to the scriptures. And after they received the baptism of fire, gift of the Holy Ghost, they understood the true meaning. 74, once again, our minds being now enlightened, we began to have the scriptures laid open to our understandings and the true meaning and intention of their more mysterious passages revealed unto us in a manner which we never could attain to previously nor ever had be nor ever before had thought of in other words the things that were coming into their mind it had never even crossed their mind before okay and now since this new experience since they received the baptism of fire they're receiving all of these new thoughts and inspiration and all of this new revelation is coming to them in the meantime, we were forced to keep secret the circumstances of having received the priesthood and our having been baptized, owing to a spirit of persecution which had already manifested itself in the neighborhood. In other words, persecution, once they received these blessings, baptism, fire, gift of the Holy Ghost, that's when the problem started. Okay, And that's been the experience of many that I have talked to. Okay, let's go to... Let's try and understand. We left off DNC 7652. Um, let's just read the second half and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of the hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power. Now, there's a lot there. Let's try and understand that. Um, not just anyone can give the gift of the Holy Ghost. And receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who was ordained and sealed unto this power. Now, in the case of Joseph and Oliver, nobody else was there except those two. So somebody else had to have come down from heaven and placed their hands upon their head and given them the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so we can infer from that that the Holy Ghost is either received by someone on this side of the veil who has been ordained and sealed unto this power, un under the power to give the gift of the Holy Ghost, or we can infer that it had that it can be given by someone on the other side of the veil. And we can assume, because Joseph and Oliver were the only two there, that somebody from the other side of the veil came down and gave them the gift of the Holy Ghost. So by by understanding that we can we can know that not just anyone can give the Holy Ghost, give the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's look at it scripturally and try and find out what exactly is going on. Let's go to 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 1, and we're going to break down what it means to be ordained and sealed um, 
to be able to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? What does that look like scripturally? What is an example of that? Third Nephi chapter 12, verse 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words unto Nephi and to those who had been called. Now remember, he taught them the doctrine of Christ in 3 Nephi 11. And it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words unto Nephi and to those who had been called. Now the number of them who had been called and received power and authority to baptize was 12, 12 disciples. And behold, he, Jesus, stretched forth his hand unto the multitude and cried unto them, saying, Blessed are ye, if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve whom I have chosen from among you to minister unto you and to be your servants. And unto them I have, been, I have given power that they may baptize you with water. Now notice how the Savior specifies just water there. It's only water. A complete baptism, remember, is baptism by water, baptism by fire, and baptism by the Holy Ghost. Unto them I have given power that they may baptize you with water. And after that ye are baptized with water, behold, I, he says, I will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. In other words, it's Jesus Christ. He is the keeper at the gate. Behold, I will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, blessed are ye if ye shall believe in me and be baptized after that ye have seen me and know that I am. So Jesus Christ is the keeper at the gate. You cannot lie. You cannot lie to the Lord. You cannot go into your bishop's interview for your interview to receive baptism and the Holy Ghost and lie. You can lie to your bishop. You can lie to your stake president. You can, I don't know, you can give him money to let you to let you get through the interview. There's a lot of ways that you can that you can pass through men, but you cannot pass through unworthily to Jesus Christ. Let's look at it from a scriptural standpoint. Second Nephi 941. Let's look at that. We're, we're talking about Christ being the keeper at the gate. Second Nephi 941. Oh, then my beloved brethren come unto the Lord, the Holy one. Remember that his paths are righteous. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. I like that distinction. There is no bishop. There is no stake president. There is nobody there but Jesus Christ. He is the one who opens the gate to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he employeth no servant there. And there is none other way save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. Now, he does ordain servants to perform this ordinances, ordinance, and we're going to read about that in 3 Nephi. But they are selected by him, and he selects them, and then he seals them to the Melchizedek priesthood. And let's look at a scriptural example of it. Let's go to 3 Nephi chapter 18, verses 36 and 37. And it came to pass that when Jesus had made an end of these sayings, he touched with his hand the disciples whom he had chosen, one by one, even until he had touched them all, and spake unto them as he touched them. And the multitude heard not the words which he spake. Therefore, they did not bear record. But the disciples bear record that he, Jesus, gave them, the disciples, power to give the Holy Ghost. And I will show unto you hereafter that this record is true. So the Holy Ghost in this instance, look at what these people had been through. These 2,500 people who were witnessing this event. Okay, They had been driven forth from their cities. They had suffered through earthquakes and tempests. And the entire shape of the land had been changed. And they had, had, they had driven... They had killed or, or driven all of the Gadianton robbers from, from before them and fled from all the Gadianton robbers, and now they're all dead. And they had had the personal visitation of Jesus Christ to them. They had been baptized, but they still hadn't received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, They still don't have that. 
In fact, they didn't even have the power to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now Christ is there and he's saying, hey, I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost, but I'm going to authorize my servants. I'm going to authorize, I am going to work through my authorized servants to make that happen. Um, let's read verse 37 one more time. And the multitude heard not the words which he spoke, which he spake. Therefore, they did not bear record, but the disciples bear record that he gave them power to give the Holy Ghost. And I show unto you hereafter that this record is true. Okay. Now, where does it show hereafter that this record is true? Well, it's in Moroni chapter two, verses one through three. Again, we go through this quite a bit, but it's so important. The words of Christ, Moroni chapter two, verse one, the words of Christ, which he spake unto his disciples, the 12 whom he had chosen as he laid his hands upon them. And he called them by name saying, he shall call on the father in my name, in mighty prayer. And after ye have done this, he shall have power that to him upon whom ye shall lay your hands, ye shall give the Holy Ghost. And in my name shall ye give it, for thus do mine apostles. Now Christ spake these words unto them at the time of his first appearing. This is referring back to 3 Nephi 18. And the multitude heard it not, but the disciples heard it. And on as many as they laid their hands fell the Holy Ghost. So they didn't give the gift to everyone, only on as many as they laid their hands. And how did they know on who to lay their hands? Well, they entered into covenant. Now, if they, if they did not enter into covenant with Heavenly Father and go to Father and say, and say, Father, is this person ready to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? Can I lay my hands on this person and bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost upon them? If they didn't do that, then they could lay their hand, even though they had the power to bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost, they could lay their hands on a person's head, say, I give you the gift of the Holy Ghost by the power of the priesthood, and nothing would happen because they didn't go to Father first and check with Father. The ordinance of this ordinance of receiving the baptism of fire and the gift of the Holy Ghost or, or entering in by the gate is justification. Christ is the keeper of the gate. Of the gate. He is the one who justifies you. He lets you in. And to, to try and, I guess, explain this a little more right now, Satan has claim on our souls. Unless we have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, Satan is the one who claims our souls. And now that's the law. That is justice because we are unclean. We are fallen and Satan lays claim on us. Now, if you follow Jesus Christ and enter into covenant with him, then, then he justifies you so that the law of justice, or so, or so not so that the law of justice has no more claim on you because, because Jesus Christ has satisfied that law. Jesus Christ satisfied the law of justice so that Satan has no more claim on you. But that requires entering into covenant with Jesus Christ and doing what he tells you to do. The law of justice was satisfied with the atonement. Christ gives you mercy if you follow him. That justice, that justification occurs at the entrance to the gate. That's when that occurs. This is the ascension level that most of us are at here in this mortality. And this is the entire purpose of the Book of Mormon. It is to teach us about entering into covenant with Jesus Christ. It is the first step over and over and over again. We read about people in the, in the Book of Mormon who receive the testimony of Jesus and, to, and who enter into covenant with him. I mean, that really think about it. That is all the Book of Mormon is about. That is Lehi, that is Nephi, that's Jacob, that's Enos, that's Alma the Elder, that's Alma the Younger, over and over and over again throughout the entire Book of Mormon. That is all we see is people receiving the testimony of Jesus and entering into covenant with him. And well, let's keep going. Let's keep going in D&C 76. D&C 76, verse 53. And who overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. And wow, there's a lot there. There is a lot in that verse. Let's read it one more time. And who overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, 
which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. We're going to break it down, but just reading it like that, it's almost just a jumble of words that we don't understand. Um, let's understand it. And who overcome. Let's start with those three words. And who overcome. Who is this speaking about? Well, it's the one that's reading it. It's speaking to us. Now, remember, by this point in our ascension process, we've received the testimony of Jesus. In other words, we've awakened. We have awakened to our awful situation and we realize how fallen and how much in trouble we are and how much we need Jesus Christ. We've, we've received that testimony. We have been baptized with water. We have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, baptism by fire, gift of the Holy Ghost. We've entered in by the gate. That's where we are, which is a higher ascension than most of us are at right now. So verse 53, and who overcome? Well, overcome what? What is left? What do I have to do after I fulfill the doctrine of Christ? Faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost. What do I have after that? Well, it never ends. The new and everlasting covenant never ends. I enter into covenant with the Lord over and over and over again. Okay. And who overcome? Well, let's take Joseph Smith as an example of one who overcame. One who overcomes what? Well, everything, everything that Heavenly Father sees fit to give you. Uh, LDS.org, there is, there is a little article on Joseph Smith, and it was actually quite good. Um, I'm just going to read a paragraph from it, and it should be up there on the screen. I can't see it, but it just says, Few have confronted more antagonism and trials than did Joseph Smith. He was besieged with dozens of unjustified lawsuits and was often in jeopardy of his life. He was poisoned, beaten, tarred, unjustly imprisoned, and once sentenced to die by firing squad. He and Emma seldom had a home of their own, and six of their children died in infancies. Financial difficulties continually plagued the family. So, verse 53, VNC 76, verse 53, and who overcome who overcome what? Well, everything, everything. There's a quote by Joseph Smith, given May 21st, 1843. It's History of the Church, um, five, page 401. Joseph Smith, a really common quote, really cool. I am like a huge rough stone rolling down from a high mountain, and the only polishing I get is when some corner gets rubbed off by coming in contact with something else. Striking with accelerated force against religious bigotry, priestcraft, lawyercraft, doctorcraft, lying, editors, so, so board, excuse me, suborn judges and jurors, and the authority of perjured executives backed by mobs, blasphemers, licentious and corrupt men and women, all hell knocking off a corner here and a corner there. Thus I will become a smooth and polished shaft in the quiver of the Almighty. Joseph Smith went through all those things. I was going to read DNC section 121, but we don't have enough time. So DNC, moving on, DNC 76, 53 again, and who overcome, overcome what? Everything. And it's not just within us. It is through Jesus Christ and who overcome by faith, overcome by faith in who? Not in ourselves, not in another man, not in money. We don't, we don't rely on money to overcome the things that God gives to us and who overcome by faith, faith in who? Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus Christ that we overcome these trials and who overcome by faith and are sealed by the, by the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, you, might, you have to prove yourself true and faithful. You have to overcome by faith. You have to enter into the new and everlasting covenant. You have to go to the Lord with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Again, you don't do it on your own. You enter into covenant with the Lord and through him is who you do it through. The Holy Ghost is given by Jesus Christ. We saw that in 3 Nephi 12. And there we read in 76 verse 53 that the Holy Spirit of promise is given by the Father, okay, and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We're going to find out what that is in a minute. Are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. Jesus Christ gives the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Father is the one who gives 
the Holy Spirit of promise. The Father sheds that forth upon all those who are just and true. Okay, so who is the Holy Spirit of promise? Well, what did the Father give us? Well, he gave us his only begotten son. So who is the Holy Spirit of promise that the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true? Well, it's Jesus Christ. There's none other possible that it could be. The Son, the Son, Jesus Christ, is the Holy Spirit of promise given by the Father. The Son is the keeper of the gate, also called the Father. The Father is the keeper of, the, the Son is the keeper of the gate for the Holy Ghost. We could say also that the Father is the keeper of the gate to Jesus Christ, or having your calling and election made sure, or second comfort, or whatever you want to call it. That's the meaning of these verses in DNC seven of these words in DNC 76 verse 53. What we're talking about here is receiving your calling and election made sure. This is the next level of ascension after receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's entering in and being presented to Christ in the fullness of his glory. Okay, let's break this down a little bit more. Now we talked about we talked about the Son giving the gift of the Holy Ghost and we talked about the Father giving Give, shedding forth or giving to us, presenting the Son to us, the Holy Spirit of promise, okay? Now, there's some verses that this applies to later in, in DNC 76. DNC 76, verses 86 through 88, and these verses are very misunderstood. It talks about ministration, 86 through 88. These are they, this is talking about telestial people, and we'll cover this in future future live streams. These are they who receive not of his fullness in the eternal world, but of the Holy Spirit through the ministration of the terrestrial. In other words, Christ is the one who gives the Holy Spirit, who opens the gate, and the terrestrial through the ministration of the celestial. In other words, the Father is the one who presents Christ to us. And also the telestial receive it of the administering of angels who are, who are appointed to minister for them. Them is referring to telestial beings. Verse 88, one more time. And also the telestial, that's us, receive it, receive it of the administering of angels who are appointed to minister for them, telestial beings, or who are appointed to be ministering spirits for them. Again, the them is telestial beings. For they, those are telestial beings, they who receive the ministering of angels, for they shall be heirs of salvation. Excuse me. Does that makes sense. And also the telestial, let's do it one more time, verse 88. And also the telestial receive it of the administering of angels who are appointed to minister for them or who are appointed to be ministering spirits for them. For they, if the telestial beings, shall be heirs of salvation if they accept those angels and the ministering of those angels. Okay, so that's what the word ministration means and, and how all that works. That's why in the first vision, the father is the one who introduces the son and the son is the one who is the keeper of the gate, keeper at the gate for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Christ administers that, as we read in 3 Nephi 12, verse 1. Okay, moving on. DNC 76, verse 54. Now, these, okay, now we've just learned about the second comforter or having your calling and election made sure, entering into the fullness of the glory of the Lord. DNC 76, verse 54. They are they who are the church of the firstborn. Now, who? what is the church of the firstborn? This is the celestial order church. The church of Christ is a terrestrial order, and the church of the Latter-day Saints is a telestial order. So if you have entered into the rest of the Lord and seen his face and have received your calling and election, and that has been made sure, you have entered into the rest of the Lord, you've been taught by the Lord face to face, you are a member of the church of the firstborn. Baptism by fire and the gift of the Holy Ghost is entrance into the church of Christ. And really, there is no real entry requirement to enter into the preparatory church of man. That's just whatever, whatever the, for example, the baptismal interview to be baptized into the LDS church, whatever those, whatever the men making those requirements say that those requirements are, that's what the requirements are. Okay, Alma, verse 36, 25, and 26. We'll wrap up here in about 10 minutes. This is Alma speaking to his son, Shiblon. Okay, and this, again, we're talking about entering into the rest of the Lord and, and the church of the firstborn. Who are the citizens? Who are the members of that church? 
Alma 36, 25 and 26. Alma speaking to his son, Shiblon. Verse 25, yea, and now behold, O my son, the Lord doth give me exceedingly great joy in the fruit of my labors. Now, what is the fruit of Alma's labors? This is Alma speaking to his son. Verse 26, for because of the word, who is the word? It's Jesus Christ. For because of the word which he has imparted unto me, behold, many have been born of God and have tasted as I have tasted and have seen eye to eye as I have seen. Therefore, they do know of these things of which I have spoken as I do know. And the knowledge which I have is of God. Okay, what Alma is saying here is he has entered into the rest of the Lord. He is a member of that church, the church of the firstborn. And why is he a member of that? Because he has seen eye to eye the Lord Jesus Christ. They have seen eye to eye as I have seen. Therefore, they do know of these things of which I have spoken as I do know. And the knowledge which I have is of God. In other words, it is possible to enter into the presence of the Lord in the fullness of his glory in this life, right now, right here. And it's not just for a special few elite group of people. It's for everyone. This is what the Lord wants us to do. This is his plan for us. This is what Alma did. Okay, let's talk about the church of the firstborn. Let's go back to DNC 7654. This is the church that Alma is a member of. This is what he is telling us. The, the, they are they who are the church of the firstborn. Alma is saying, I am a member of that church because I have seen eye to eye Jesus Christ. Let's go to Abraham chapter one, verse three. Okay, who is the firstborn? Many people think this is Jesus Christ. That's not right. Abraham chapter one, verse three. It was conferred upon me, this is the priesthood, from the fathers. It came down from the fathers, from the beginning of time, yea, even from the beginning or before the foundation of the earth down to the present time, even the right of the firstborn or the first man who is Adam or first father through the fathers unto me. So who is the firstborn? It is Adam. The church of the firstborn, that is the church of heavenly father. Church of the firstborn, first man, Adam, first father. Okay, that's that couldn't be any more clear. Man, firstborn, firstborn, first man, Adam, heavenly father, church of the firstborn. Okay, church of the Latter-day Saints, that's a man's church, church of Christ, terrestrial order church, entrance into that, baptism of fire, gift of the Holy Ghost, church of the firstborn, or Adam's church, or the Father's church, that's a celestial church, entrance into that is entering into the rest of the Lord, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Calling and election made sure, second comforter. Okay, let's delve a little deeper into this calling and election made sure, second comforter, church of the firstborn. A few more scriptures and we'll be done. BNC 88, one through five, okay? And I was just in a Sunday school class last Sunday where this was being discussed in an LDS Sunday school class, and there was never a consensus that anyone reached to. So hopefully we can come to a consensus consensus tonight and understand what really is going on in DNC 88, one through five. Verse one, verily, thus saith the Lord unto you who have assembled yourselves together to receive his will concerning you. Behold, in other words, these people have entered into the new and everlasting covenant. What is, what is your will, Lord, for us? Verse two, behold, this is pleasing unto your Lord and the angels rejoice over you. The alms of your prayers have come up into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath and are recorded in the book of the names of the sanctified, even them of the celestial world. In other words, we talked about justification. Sanctification is a whole other level. That is entering into the rest of the Lord and being cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, that is that is celestial church, church of the firstborn. Verse three, wherefore, I now send upon you another comforter, even upon you, my friends, that it may abide in your hearts, even the Holy Spirit of promise, which other comforter is the same that I promised unto my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John. This comforter is the promise which I give unto you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom. This is having your calling and election made sure, being sealed up to eternal life. Which glory, verse five, which glory is that of the church of the firstborn, even of God, Adam, 
the holiest of all, through Jesus Christ, his son. I think that's pretty clear. John 14, 15 through 18. This is the cross reference for verse 3, where the Lord says, as is recorded in the testimony of John. John 14, 15 through 18. 15, if ye love me, this is the Lord speaking, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If ye love me, enter into covenant with me and do the things that I tell you to do. Verse 16, this is the one, and I will pray the Father, for he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. In other words, keep my commandments and I will give you first the baptism of fire, get the Holy Ghost, and then I will give you the other comforter, the second comforter, who is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, Christ, he says it right there, it couldn't be any more clear, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. He tells us right there, okay, who he is, even the spirit of truth, Christ. And like I said, I was in a Sunday school a couple days ago, and there was no consensus as to what this was talking about, this second comforter, BNC 88, 1 through 5. Um, <clears throat> now, this is what I'll leave you with. In the LDS scriptures prior to 2013, the footnote in John chapter 14, verse 16, the footnote for other comforter is Jesus Christ, second comforter. That's what the footnote says in scriptures prior to 2013. Now, I don't know if it's up on the screen there, but footnote 16a, it has been changed in the new scriptures to Holy Ghost. The other comforter is now thought to be the Holy Ghost. I don't think it could be any clearer what we, from what we've read that it is actually Jesus Christ, but it has been changed. So my final question is this, something to ponder. Feel free to post in the comments. You can contact me on Facebook under Steve Reiner Messenger. Um, you can post in the live stream. This is something to, to ponder. If the comforter spoken about in verse 4 is indeed the Holy Ghost, okay, which is what we receive in the LDS church at age 8. Now, according to this scripture in DNC 88 verse 4, we are sealed up to eternal life in the celestial kingdom if we have received that Holy Spirit of promise, which we receive at age eight after baptism, according to traditional LDS tradition. Okay, I hope you're with me. If the comforter spoken about in verse four is indeed the Holy Ghost, according to the scripture in DNC 88.4, then we are sealed up to eternal life in the celestial kingdom. Once we receive the Holy Ghost, according to DNC 88, verse 4. And if that really is the Holy Ghost and not Jesus Christ, as the new scriptures assert, what is the purpose of the temple? And I would like your opinion on this. And I haven't spoken to anyone that has been able to answer this for me. So I hope that somebody can answer this for me. If that really is the Holy Ghost and we're sealed up to eternal life, and maybe I'm not understanding it right, maybe I need correction. In DNC 88.4, if that really is the Holy Ghost, as the new scriptures assert, then what is the purple of the, the purpose of the washing and anointings in the temple and the endowment and the sealings? So please share with me your opinions and your thoughts on that matter. And I hope I've made myself clear on, on what I mean by all of that. And please, please, I, I, I am welcome and open to correction. I just want you to know who's ever listening that I do love the Lord with all my heart. I love him and I seek to enter into covenant with him. He is the only one that I seek. He is my king and my God, and I am subject only to him. I love him and I pray that I may be lifted up with Mormon and Nephi and Joseph Smith and all the great prophets of old at the last day. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, okay.
Does anyone have any? Okay, there's a question right there. Um, DNC 76, 86 through 88. There's there's a question. There's a question there. DNC 76, 86 through 88 is still very confusing to me. Anyone understand it better? Okay, let's go through it one more time. 76. Let me get my scriptures out here. 76, 86 through 88. Okay, so as we read in, in 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 1, we read that Jesus Christ is the one who bestows the Holy Ghost. Okay, and we read later on in DNC 76 that Father is the one who presents Jesus Christ, okay? So DNC 76, 86 through 88. These are speaking of telestial beings here. And we're going to do a couple more, two or three. I don't know how long this will take to get all the way through DNC 76. We made it through five verses tonight, but we will keep going through this. DNC 76, 86. These are they who receive not of his fullness in the eternal world, but of the Holy Spirit through the ministration of the terrestrial. Okay, so Jesus Christ has stewardship over the terrestrial kingdom. Jesus Christ is the one who will rule and reign in the millennium. Now, the church of Christ is the church that will rule and reign in the millennium. Jesus Christ is the head of that church. That's why it's called the church of Christ. Okay, so Jesus Christ is the one who gives us the gift of the Holy Ghost here in the telestial kingdom. These are they who receive not of his fullness in the eternal world, but of the Holy Spirit through the ministration of the terrestrial. I guess I don't know how to explain it so that you can understand it. Jesus Christ is the one who is the keeper at the gate. We receive of the Holy Spirit here in the telestial world and jesus christ is the one who who gives that gift to us he is the keeper of the gate okay verse 87 and the terrestrial through the ministration of the celestial now again who has stewardship over the terrestrial kingdom that is jesus christ the church of christ is the church that presides in the millennium and the terrestrial through the ministration of the celestial who is it that presents Jesus Christ to us? Well, it's Father. It is a celestial being. Well, they're both celestial, but the Father has stewardship over the celestial kingdom. Father presents Jesus Christ to us and the terrestrial through the ministration of the celestial. I hope that I hope you're I hope I'm explaining it well. I don't I'm sorry. It's my it's it's my limited vocabulary and I don't know how to explain it. Verse 88, and also the telestial receive it of the administering of angels. In other words, us, we're the telestial, we are temporal. And also the telestial receive it of the administering of angels who are appointed to minister for them or who are appointed to be ministering spirits for them, for they shall be heirs of salvation. These are telestial people. So, in other words, if we receive these ministering angels into our lives and they minister unto us and we accept them, we are the ones who will be heirs of salvation. I, I don't know if I explained that right. I'm please, if you if anybody else has a better explanation, please post it in the comments on the YouTube channel or on Doctrine of Christ in Facebook. Um, anybody else? Any other questions or Adam is the firstborn in, in this world, i.e. this eternal realm, but does that mean he is the first son of heavenly father, first of the intelligence? Okay, let me think about that question. Adam is the firstborn in this world, in this eternal realm. Oops, it went away. Bring that back up, please. Adam is the firstborn in this world. 
in this eternal realm, in this celestial kingdom. But does that mean he is the first son of heavenly father, first of the intelligence? Well, okay, we're getting into some pretty deep, deep mysteries here. And I guess I will just share a few scriptures and I will let you draw your own conclusions on those scriptures. Um, the firstborn, Abraham chapter 1, verse 3, it's pretty clear on who the firstborn is. It was conferred upon me. That's moving all over. Let me get to Abraham here. Abraham chapter 1, verse 3. It was, and Abraham, by the way, if I did, I did a whole class on the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it revert and how and how it is, how we should be viewing, how we could view that through the eyes of the book of Abraham. I covered the first four verses or first half of Abraham one. Um, it, I go, we go into great detail. It's called the, it's, it, it was about two months ago, back in May, two and a half months ago. But if you're interested in the book of Abraham, go back and listen to that. Verse three, chapter one, verse three, it, this is the priesthood. It was conferred upon me from the fathers. It came down from the fathers from the beginning of time, yea, even from the beginning or before the foundation of the earth down to the present time, even the right of the firstborn or the first man who is Adam or first father through the fathers unto me. Um, I'm just going to share some scriptures and let you enter into your own conclusions. Okay, we're going to go to D and C chapter 27 now dnc chapter 27 verse 11 dnc chapter 27 verse 11 okay i'll just read it here speaking of michael we're talking about remember we're talking about the firstborn and who that is 27 11 I'll wait for it to come up here so you can read with me. Again, the question was regarding the firstborn, who that is. And also with Michael or Adam, so we know that they are the same person, the father of all, the prince of all the ancient of days now take that and extrapolate that extrapolate from that what you will and possibly do a google search for who is the ancient of days daniel talks about the ancient of days but in generally in every other christian church and in christianity in general the Ancient of Days is recognized as God the Father, as our Heavenly Father. So extrapolate that out of that what you will. Anything else? Anybody have any other questions? I hope I explained that well enough. I don't know if I did, but um, if there's no other questions, uh, Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I can't, I don't know who the next presenter is, but uh, thank you again for joining us. And we'll see you next time.